I'm happy to have this opportunity to uh, continue where I started yesterday. Uh, never having enough time, but uh, this gives me a chance to have yesterday lay out uh, the reemergence of biological definitions of race in science and biotechnology and politics and business. And today, what I want to address is, as the, the subtitle says, why care? Why should we care about this? So uh, just to give a very brief review of yesterday for those of you who weren't here or who have forgotten what I said yesterday, a new, I, I, in my book fail invention, I argue that we're witnessing in the United States a new biopolitics of race that has three major components. One, that many scientists in biomedical research, genomic research, uh, genetic research, uh, sociology, uh, anthropology, are redefining race as a biological category written in our genes. And of course, race as a biological classification has been a prominent part of science since the uh, 1700s, principally. Um, but so when I say they're redefining it, I don't mean that this is the first this has been invented, but it's a reinvention, this time stated in, in genetic terms, uh, with supposed genetic confirmation of the uh, fact that race is found in nature, that human beings are naturally divided into racial categories using uh, you know, high-tech computer programming and fancy mathematical algorithms and big DNA data sets or sometimes tiny DNA data sets. Uh, and then the second component is that the, bio, the uh, biotech and pharmaceutical industries are converting that racial science. So it's really not that they're actually taking science and converting. What they're doing is converting the idea of uh, a confirmed uh, biological distinction among human races. The idea that race is a proxy for genetic difference, taking that to create uh, and justify new biotechnologies and pharmaceuticals, like race-specific medicine, for example. Yesterday I talked about the case of Vidal, a, a therapy for patients with heart failure that the FDA approved in 2005 for marketing specifically to African American, self-identified African American patients. Uh, I also mentioned um, the use of race in reproductive medicine and the marketing of eggs and sperm uh, and ancestry testing uh, companies that claim to be able to tell you what race you are, or what uh, proportions of different races you are, or to trace your ancestry to particular uh, African, Jewish, or Native American tribes. Uh, so those are some examples of these race-specific products. Uh, and the third component, which is what I want to focus more on today, having laid out these developments in science and biotechnology, is that this new invention, reinvention, uh, reconfiguration, refurbishing of the concept that race is a fact of nature uh, is happening at a time when many people believe we are beyond race and racism in America, that we're living in a post-racial society where social inequality no longer hinders people's opportunities to succeed in America. And so uh, my, my argument is that that is an especially dangerous time for this uh, concept, this myth, to be reincarnated because it provides an explanation for how it could be that racism doesn't hinder anyone's opportunities and yet there are disproportionate numbers of blacks and Latinos in prisons, have hugely disproportionate numbers of blacks and Latinos in prisons and under criminal justice supervision, that uh, black children are far less likely to graduate from high school and go to college than white children in this country, that blacks 
have, and other uh, people of color, higher rates of certain diseases and poor health outcomes in general. Uh, how can you explain, as I pointed out yesterday, that in Chicago, black women are twice as likely to die of breast cancer even than white women, even though they have a lower incidence of breast cancer? How can all that be if racism no longer hinders people's opportunities? Well, perhaps this new science explains it. It's because of genetic difference among the principal human races. And uh, so it's a very powerful way, I think, of potentially uh, hindering continued efforts to end racial inequality in America and across the world. So um, I just have to also mention that uh, for those of you who weren't at Alden Morris's talk about uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, the, uh, his development of scientific sociology. The whole talk was about how Du Bois, starting in, in, at the end of the 19th century, uh, challenged the dominant notion that the reason for racial inequality in America was because of inherited difference. And Du Bois argued that, that it was no, it was because of social inequality. Uh, the, exact, the exact same debate going on today. The exact same debate going on today. All right. So, when I talk about this subject, some people are shocked. A race, as I was when I heard about a race-specific medicine. Why are you telling me the FDA approved a race? How could that possibly be? Uh, shocked to start hearing lectures where people are stating matter-of-factly that there are genetic differences between the principal human races and uh, the point, whole point of genetic research and population studies should be to find out you know, more about those differences. That's what's going to end health disparities in America. I was shocked by all of this, but many other people I talk to uh, who have read my book or heard me uh, speak, their response is uh, either, well, of course there are these differences, you know, what's the big deal? Well, you know those differences exist, I don't understand what you could be writing about. Uh, or those who know that they, they, uh, they, they've heard of and you may even uh, subscribe to the idea that race is socially constructed, the response is often, well, but it, this isn't such a big deal that some scientists are looking into genetic differences between races. What, what are you so upset about, Dorothy? <laughs> this is, just let them do their thing. It's not going to make that much difference. I mean, maybe they'll find, this is one of the response I get, maybe they'll find something. Maybe they will find something. But if they do, then what's the harm? So I thought in this second lecture, I would discuss the question, why care about it? Why care about it? And I'm going to go about it by giving some responses that I've received about why we shouldn't worry, and then say why that we should worry. <laughs> okay. So my point here is to worry everybody <laughs> listening to me. <laughs> and then you might have one of these responses about why we shouldn't worry, and I hope to convince you that you should be very worried about this. Okay. So one response is just worry about the racists. Don't worry about the scientists. They're not racist. They're, they, you know, most of them are trying to improve minority health. Uh, many of them, like Esteban Burchard, they are, they're people of color themselves. Uh, Esteban Burchard, a, a researcher at um, University of California, San Francisco, is um, looking for uh, the African gene that explains why uh, black and Puerto Rican children have more severe asthma. And he will tell you, I interviewed him for my book, and others have done research in his lab, uh, he, he's on a mission to help black and Puerto Rican children. Uh, and he sees it at, at almost, I mean, at, not almost, as a civil rights kind of mission. 
And his response about doing this science is, well, I'm not a racist. The people doing this re research are racist. What you need to do is just stop, try to stop racists from using our science. But we shouldn't stop the science. So, you know, he says, scientifically, I don't think we should fear what other folks are doing, like David Duke. I don't know if you all are familiar with David Duke, was a, a KKK grand wizard who went into politics at one point. And it turns, he mentions David Duke because David Duke uses his research on his white supremacist <laughs> website as proof that black people are inferior, genetically inferior. And so, of course, the Burchard, you know, doesn't like that at all. But he's saying uh, that they distort our findings, but that shouldn't deter us from doing good science. All right, well, he misses the point that the very assumptions going into the science itself are based on a racist history of classifying people into natural races. So the very assumptions are racist. He may not be racist, but his ideas about race were created by racists. They were created to support racist campaigns of slavery and conquest. And so it's not an answer to say, just worry about the racists. We should worry about the very notions of race that are being used, regardless of who's using them. Besides which, he says, it should not deter us from doing good science. Well, my argument is that when these scientists are using race as a natural category that is genetically determined, they are engaging in bad science. And that the very notions about race are flawed notions about race, but using race the way many of them do, also they use it in flawed ways. So for example, many of them are using, they're, well, they're all, <laughs> a vast majority, I don't, you know, John Fujimura has, has shown how some of them are trying to come up with genetically based groupings that often are conflated with race, right? So some of them are trying to find genetic groupings, but the vast majority of people doing the biomedical research, for example, they're using social categories. They're using <coughs> research subjects who identify as black, as white, as Asian, as Native American, and that's the categories they're using. And then they turn them into and treat them as if they're genetically determined categories. So they'll, for example, do research trying to find, let's say, genetic differences between, um, that explain the difference in hypertension. Let's just pick one. You know, so they're going to look at um, research subjects who are black, compare them with research subjects who are white and Asian. Put, the, put that study out there. How are they going to determine who's black, who's white, who's Asian? In most cases, they just ask, what are you? <laughs> you know? And if you say, I'm black, you get into the black category. Why is it that if someone from South Africa says they're black, you know, who just, let's say they just arrived in the United States this year, they say they're black, they get in the black category. Someone who grew up, of, of, uh, someone African American who perhaps most of their ancestors are from Europe, but their great-grandmother was black, so they had identified black. They get put in the black category. Someone from Ethiopia who says, I'm black, they get put in the black category. Uh, anybody who identifies as black, regardless of their ancestry, they get put in the black category. So how that could be a genetic category is not explained in most of these studies. It's, they're simply misusing the category. If they were doing the study to answer a social question. You know, what are the social reasons why blacks in America have higher rates of hypertension? Then it would make sense to use a social category. But if the point of the study is to reach some genetic conclusion, 
then you, they have to at least explain how this lumping together of people of multiple ancestries based on a social definition uh, is the right category to use. Uh, and related to that, there usually is no definition or scientific criteria to identify and assign people to social care. So sometimes it's self-identification, as I said. Um, there's a, a study I point to in my book where uh, looking at uh, reasons for high rates of, I can't remember the disease right now, it may have been diabetes among Hispanics, and the uh, researcher to determine who was Hispanic looked at last name. Last name, how can last name be an accurate category for a supposedly genetic classification? Uh, or sometimes the researchers just look at people and decide. And then I also quote another researcher, says, well, the white people, if they look pure, I put them in the white category. If they look like they might be mixed with something else, I put them in another category. So these very unscientific methods uh, are used in many of these studies. And then there's the problem of residual confounding where researchers who usually aren't geneticists uh, but are trying to reach genetic conclusions, they will control for some social factors. And then if they continue to find a racial difference, they leap to the conclusion it must be genetic. The problem with that is unless they have control for every single possible social reason that there could be a racial difference, they cannot conclude that it's a genetic cause. And so in many of these uh, studies, they pick something that's supposed to represent all possible social environmental uh, contributors to the difference. Like they might pick zip code or they might pick welfare receipt or income, but they haven't looked at uh, anything about the life, the, the entire life course of the people. You know, so somebody could have a high income today, but have grown up in poverty. That's possible. So you don't know, they don't know about what their experience was growing up. The other big factor that very few studies look at, especially if they want to find a genetic conclusion, is the impact of experiencing racism on people's health. That's completely left out. So you could be high in income earning, you could live in a predominantly white neighborhood or zip code, that doesn't mean you aren't experiencing racial discrimination or haven't experienced it all your life, and that stress has affected your health. You know, there's lots of good evidence now that stress is a major contributor to poor health outcomes. Uh, and so, it just is something simple, like when it, looking at why young black men are more likely to die of heart failure, and looking for a genetic reason for it, I would say, well, what about the fact that most young black men, when they hear a police siren, you know, their heart starts palpitating. It doesn't happen as much to other people in our society. What about that? Then could that anxiety about police have an impact on your health? I would think so. I would think it has an impact on young black people's health knowing that in certain neighborhoods they have a 50-50 chance of going to prison, but that most of these researchers don't factor in something like that. And so the measures are inadequate. Uh, so let me give you an example of a study that was published in 2007 that I think has all of these flaws in it. And this is not an unusual study. Uh, the researchers wanted to find out why it was that black women have higher rates of preterm births. And actually, they should have been more specific because it's not black women. It's black women born in the United and raised in the United States have higher rates of preterm births. Women from the continent of Africa who moved to the United States, their 
deliveries are just as healthy as white women in the United States. It's only if you've grown up in the United States, black, that there's a higher incidence of preterm birth, which raises questions about any genetic, that would already lead you to say it's probably not a genetic reason, but these researchers wanted to find a genetic reason for racial differences in preterm birth. So the, here's their hypothesis. Black race, independent of other factors, increases the risk of extreme preterm birth and its frequency of recurrence. I'm, I'm just always astounded when I read that. What does that mean, black race, independent of other factors? What does that even mean? What is black race? What is that? And what would it mean, independent of other factors? What, what other factors? What is, I think what they mean by this is there's something called, there's something that we can identify as biological black race. And that biological fact of nature of blackness that's found naturally in certain people's bodies is we can look at that independent of social factors that are related to race. I can't think of what else that could mean. I think that's what that means. But the very hypothesis is, I don't know, if I don't, just think about it. If, you, if I were a journal editor <laughs> where at the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, if I, were, I would say, well, I don't understand what that means. You have a hypothesis that is unclear. The hy very hypothesis of the study is I just find it, it's intriguing, <laughs> but I'm not sure what it means. Uh, but anyway, that was their um, hypothesis. Basically, you know, I do know what, it, what they meant. What they meant was, was that the distinctive genes of black people increases the risk of extreme preterm birth regardless of social factors. That's, that's what that means. And again, this is not an unusual hypothesis to find in scientific journals, in studies in scientific journals. Okay, so how are they going to go about proving their hypothesis? So they calculate the independent influence of race. Again, they're already conceived of it as a biological classification, right? Um, uh, separately from socioeconomic status. So they're trying to see to what extent is socioeconomic status influencing this apart from biological race, and how do they determine whether it's socioeconomic status or biological race. They control for Medicaid, food stamp, and WIC receipt. That's, those are their social, that is the full extent of their social factors. All right, the full extent of their social factors and maternal medical risk factors like lack of prenatal care and smoking. All right, they find that after controlling for these factors independent of black race, that there is still a higher risk among black women. And so what they then conclude that this suggests a probably, I'm sorry, it's probable, sorry, that's a typo, probable genetic component that may underlie the public health problem presented by the racial disparity in preterm birth. Now, I don't think that their findings suggest a probable genetic component at all. I think their findings suggest they need to look further into the probable socioeconomic reasons. So again, if I were reviewing this study, I would say there's some flaws in this study. But you might say, okay, this study was so flawed, shouldn't get any attention. Oh, I forgot one important part. No, so many of these studies, they don't stop at the findings that are flawed. They go on to postulate why they think it would be that black people, that there would be a race of people who were predisposed for their children, their babies, 
to suffer potentially lethal conditions. Right? Does, does that make any, like that doesn't even make sense. That's one of the most backward evolution. I, I know enough from biology 101 that if it would be very hard for a, a, a big group of people to pass on a genetic mutation or genetic trait that kills babies, right? That, that would be the kind that natural selection would not select for, I would think. But anyway, so then they come up with a, they, have, they need some explanation. We postulate that although it's a detrimental outcome of price, it may be the result of a, some other selective advantage that it gives black people. There's some positive th reason why black people, <laughs> it's just, well, there's no, I mean, there's no, there's absolutely no support for this postulated theory in their study. Um, but it, but this gets published along with the flawed findings of their study. Okay, so now my point, again, you'd say, okay, this is postulating, it's, the methods weren't uh, good, um, it shouldn't get much attention, but it gets a headline in the New York Times. Study points to genetics in disparities in preterm births. And of course you know that most of the people who read this headline are not going to go back and read the study. And so what this tells people is that the reason why black people have higher rates of preterm births and higher rates of infant mortality isn't because of racist conditions in the United States, it's because their genes are predisposed them to that. So this is just an example of the kind of research that's being done using race and yet the kind of response that it very often gets. And again, as I said yesterday, please go back and read the studies. If you are tempted to believe a headline like this, I have learned, working on this book, I have learned to question every headline about, and study, especially when it comes to race, because you don't know what the methods were, how they classified people. The fact that it got a headline does not mean that it is a well done study. Okay, next uh, response I get besides just let the scientists do the good, you know, this good science about race is don't worry, be patient. <laughs> this is just a period where race is important as a proxy for genetic difference, but right around the corner, everybody is going to have their whole genome sequence. Uh, doctors and pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies will be relying on individual genome sequencing. We won't need to use race as a proxy for genetic difference anymore. So, you know, yeah, this isn't the greatest way to do science, but it's a stepping stone to the more accurate genetic science that we're going to be doing. Um, so uh, one, this is an actual response I got at, from a talk I gave at Sarah Lawrence uh, college in October, a genetic counselor, a group of genetic counselors were in the um, audience and were ex very mad at me because I suggested that it was wrong uh, for uh, uh, genetic or well, reproductive <laughs> uh, doctors to use race as a biological category in, in calculating genetic risks. And uh, she said, literally, she said, race, race is, I agree with you, race is a crappy, that, those were her terms, crappy proxy for genetic variation, but it's the best tool we have for now. And my response to her was, why would people in reproductive medicine want to use a crappy proxy? Why would you ever, it's just so, again, so strange to hear scientists say they're satisfied with a crappy method. <laughs> You know, I, I think most scientists would say, we are striving for the best, most accurate method. But for some reason, when it comes to race, it's all right to use a crappy method. 
You know, it's all right, right. So you could be very precise. Jonathan Kahn points out that in many of these studies, the genetics part of the study is five pages long with careful, you know, algorithms and permutations and calculations and everything is so precise. But they just say race. There's no definition. There's no justification. It's just thrown in the study without any any of the scientific precision. It's as if we don't have to be scientific about race. We can just, because it's so obvious, I guess. I'm not sure, but that's very typical. So um, the next is a quote uh, that Dave, David Goldstein, um, a genetic researcher at Duke, uh, said I was, I was um, being interviewed on National Public Radio and uh, I guess they thought that, you know, I, I'm not a geneticist, maybe I was misleading the audience about, about this. So they brought in David Goldstein to comment. He agreed with everything I said. But uh, he was very defensive, as many researchers in this field are, about what I said about the use of race. Because he's, you know, he's one, he's one of them. He doesn't, I'm not saying he uses it that way. But he was kind of defending his field, and he said, it's perfectly clear, we will not be using race or ethnicity in any important way going forward. What you will look at is the underlying genetic difference, and you will forget about race. However we roll out personalized medicine in the future, we will not be relying on race or ethnicity. So the, the, again, this idea that this is just a, uh, a, a uh, way station toward better science. Uh, just wait and be patient. But my response to that is, first of all, why do we need, we've been waiting for th three centuries, you know, why, why, why do we need to wait any longer? Why have we had to wait so long when there's been so much evidence to show that scientists have been using race as a fact of nature in very dangerous and flawed ways. Why, why can't we change that now? Why be satisfied with these archaic classification systems in contemporary genomic and genetic and biomedical research? And also, there's no evidence, this, and this came up uh, again in Alden Morris's talk, that was my question to him was, Du Bois pointed this out in 1898. So why is it in, you know, he showed why, the flaws then. So why do we need to still be showing the flaws in 2013? And, and Professor Morris's answer is the same answer I would give as well, which is it's political. It's not about the scientific evidence. The evidence has been there. It's about political and commercial reasons for using it. And if those political and commercial reasons persist, the use of race in science is going to persist. It may take another form, just like it's taken another form now than it did during the eugenics era, and different than it did when the European naturalists were doing it, or when Samuel Morton was doing his skull measurements. You know, it, it takes different forms, but there's always been a, crit, a critique, there's always been evidence against it, and yet it persists. So I have no confidence that the next stage of just more precise genetic measurements are that that by itself is going to make a difference. I do, I do have confidence that we can change the way we think about race. I, I wouldn't be standing up here if I didn't have confidence about that, but I don't think it's going to happen just because we have now more accurate ways of measuring individual genotypes. Uh, that, as I pointed out yesterday, the FDA, in describing Bidil as a step toward personalized medicine, in a way, was making the point that race is useful <laughs> to the marketing of personalized medicine. I mentioned yesterday also that Jonathan Kahn has pointed out patents for race-specific products where there's absolutely no need for race. 
the you know, at testing of the BRCA1 and 2 gene in African American patients with breast cancer. Why do you need a special test for African American patients? Just use the test for whether or not the human being has the G, the BRCA1 or 2 G. So it's, it's useful for getting patent protection. It's useful for marketing. It's useful for getting research funds. It's also useful to convince people that racial differences are real at the genetic level and that serves a purpose. So a, a political as well as commercial purpose. Um, but I just, don't worry, be patient, it's going to disappear. I just don't think that that's going to happen just because the science gets more accurate. All right, another response, we can't afford to worry. Uh, this response really came out in the debate about Bidel before it was approved by the FDA and uh, was supported by several black organizations, the Association of Black Cardiologists, the NAACP, Gary Puckrine's organization, National Minority Health Month Foundation, uh, supported, they initially supported Bidil, this drug which was not a race-specific drug, but then they also supported the approval of the F, by the FDA of Bidil as with a race-specific label. And the argument was, you know, we, we understand that there's been a history of um, exploitation and medical experimentation and neglect of black people in America, uh, and that the concept of biological race has been used historically for oppressive purposes. But we've got this problem of heart failure in the black community, and we need to get this drug to them, and if this is the only way the FDA is going to approve it, we, we are just going to have to go along with it. Uh, and so Puckrine recognized that there was concern about the medical and scientific validity, but under present circumstances, meaning the urgent medical needs of black people, uh, it's impractical to worry about that. Uh, Donna Christensen, of the Black Congressional Caucus uh, went even further to say that Bidil was a remedy for those medical wrongs against African Americans. It showed that the federal government was finally concerned about black people's medical needs by approving a drug just for black people. And so uh, there's uh, this argument, don't, don't worry about it, let's Look at the positive side of this, you know, and uh, many people can benefit from this myth that race is a biological fact. Um, well, I respond to that, that there can be far more harm <laughs> to black people's health that comes from promoting this myth. Uh, it's leading to this false equation that the 0.1% or 0.5% of genetic difference among human beings is classified by race. So, you know, Clinton says to me, all human beings, regardless of race, are 99.9% the same. And the response by many people seems to be, oh, yes, but that 0.1%, which is a lot of difference, you know, is, you know, in terms of genes, numbers of genes. Uh, is it, it breaks down by race, and that makes and all the difference. Like that study of preterm birth said, that is what causes unequal health outcomes. Now that false equation then leads to remedies that aren't going to solve the problem. And so, uh, to me, vital supporting a view that race is a proxy for genetic difference and the way to address health disparities uh, in heart failure is to prescribe a drug for black people is harmful to the mission to end health disparities because it's based on a false understanding of what's causing the disparities. And of course, you know, one scientific premise is that 
you, you're not going to solve a problem if you're <laughs> looking at the wrong cause of the problem. And so uh, I, I say in the, in the end, it's harmful. It's not, uh, it's not solving this urgent problem. Uh, the way I look at the relationship between race and health is that race isn't a biological category that naturally produces health disparities because of genetic difference. It's a political category that does have staggering biological consequences. That's what we're seeing in health disparities. But that's because of the impact of social inequality or racism on people's health, not because people of different races are naturally prone to have better and worse health. Okay, another don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Let's take advantage <laughs> of this new way of thinking about race as a genetic category and start our own companies. Uh, let's use it to teach black children about genetics, uh, get them interested in, in science. Uh, let's endorse it. And uh, for example, Henry Louis Gates's company, African DNA, and he's also proposed using the, the search for racial differences in uh, DNA as a way of getting, well, I, I, not, he's, he's proposed using ancestry testing. I don't know that he would say racial differences in me, but ancestry testing is a way of getting black school children interested in science. Uh, I counter that with the proposition that a better way of thinking about our identities is not as, not based in DNA, but based in common values, common political struggles, common experiences. And um, Kim Talbert, uh, a researcher and, and professor at Berkeley, now visiting at University of Texas, uh, has similarly taken issue with members of Indian tribes who propose using DNA to test for authentic Indianness or uh, authentic uh, enrollment in Indian tribes, and she argues that just the opposite, that informing enrollment policy with DNA would attack the very historical and political foundation <coughs> upon which contemporary tribal governance and land rights are based, which is in political rights, not in biological notions of Indian race. Uh, she argues that's what the white people trying to take Indians' lands <laughs> imposed on Indian tribes, the whole idea of blood quantum and all of that. Uh, Jesus, that comes from being conquered and colonized, not from a traditional Native American way of thinking about rights, which again were based on political notions of citizenship and membership. Uh, and, and rights. Okay. Uh, finally, the other response that I've gotten, and Nicholas Rose in The Politics of Life itself, I think, represents this response, which is there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> what are you so worried about? <laughs> we live in the in America, well, he's British, but we take Britain, the United States, these are liberal democracies, and you cannot take what happened during the eugenics era and apply it to the United States and Britain. I think he's forgotten that the United States was a liberal democracy during the eugenics era, too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, wasn't Germany a democracy when Hitler was, wasn't he elected? So, but any, at any rate, 
Uh, in advanced liberal democracies, at least, the biopolitics of identity is very different from that which characterized eugenics. Okay, that, that's contradictory, <laughs> again, because okay, I said it already, eugenics took root in liberal democracies. But anyway, uh, because it involves choice, enterprise, self-actualization, and prudence in relation to one's genetic makeup. So he's, he's arguing that this new biological citizenship where individuals can take control of you know, their very life itself, take control of their health, their identity, their citizenship, at the molecular level, using genetic knowledge and other um, uh, sophisticated uh, scientific bodies of knowledge, that this is about taking choice and control and managing your life. And he argues this is a new form of citizenship that is not so connected to state governance anymore. We can govern ourselves with this technology and information and the way that we form connections with other people may not be based on nation states or on races but on genetic, you know, more precise genetic similarities or um, medical advocacy. So he points out, for example, that patient advocacy groups can join with doctors and scientists to advocate for what they want in new ways uh, that don't map onto electoral politics, for example. Uh, but he sees this as, you know, in these very positive terms, choice, enterprise, self-actualization, prudence, you know, managing your genetics so that you uh, know the risks, you can make sure that you are healthy and that your children are healthy uh, by, you know, through high-tech reproductive technologies, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, etc. So what, so why <coughs> were, it's kind of related to what Esteban Burchard said. You know, yes, there's some racist, but we'll just try to keep them at bay. But generally, the science is, because of its social context, can be positive. Um, so I argue that I must be living in another world because I do not see all that choice self-actualization in this liberal democracy of ours. What I see is a trend of privatization that has been going on you know, since the Reagan era. It did not stop under Clinton, all the increased, you know, let's remember that Clinton was the one who signed the laws eliminating entitlement to welfare in the United States, but for decades a massive transfer of social services from the state to the private sphere, which actually does parallel what Rose is saying about managing, you know, your health on your own. <laughs> we saw this come out in the debate over the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, you know, the, the arguments that we should rely on government to protect our health. We should be able to uh, manage on our own. I mean, even arguments that there should be no government, ironically from the governor of Texas, you know, for example. Um, at the same time, that we're seeing this trend toward privatization and shrinking of social programs, public support for health and welfare education, um, et cetera, we're seeing massive punitive governance. No, it's not that, you know, under neoliberalism, the government, the state disappears. The state is quite <laughs> prominent when it comes to the punishment <coughs> of marginalized communities. And so uh, we see a, over the same decades, a huge skyrocketing of the prison population. Uh, 
increase in deportations. And of course, those have increased more under Obama than under Bush. This is not a Republican or Democratic sort of thing, unfortunately. You know, the, uh, in general, uh, people in power are pushing these trends of both parties uh, and uh, increased surveillance of uh, citizens and non-citizens in the United States. And again, as I said, when I discussed the, the aspects of post of the uh, new biopolitics, this is happening at a time when many people believe that racism no longer limits people's opportunity. So again, how do you explain the devastating consequences on the most uh, the least privileged communities in our country from privatization of punitive governance if there's no racism in America. Uh, so thinking about the science as being worry-free because we're in a liberal democracy is really uh, doesn't give you the accurate picture <laughs> of the potential implications of the science. You have to understand its implications in the context of privatization and very brutal punitive governance in, in America and globally as well. Uh, so there are already people who are making these connections uh, in a harmful way. Uh, and um, one way is what I see as a new twist on conservative colorblindness. Uh, the idea that is espoused by Chief Justice John Roberts that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Uh, he's arguing that the government should be colorblind and that it is unconstitutional, which is the view of a majority of justices on the US Supreme Court, it's unconstitutional for state and local governments or the federal government to use race to try to undo the legacy of Jim Crow in the United States. So in this case, parents involved in community schools versus Seattle School District number one the U.S. Supreme Court held unconstitutional the school district's attempt to desegregate schools in Seattle as a form of racial discrimination. Now it's a colorblind approach. The government should not pay attention to race. Uh, now, Eduardo Bonilla Silva pointed out in his classic book, Racism Without Racist, that colorblindness is a way of defining Ending a system of racial oppression in the post, uh, it, it, well now in the post civil rights era, it's it um, because it says, well, so the civil rights era cured racism in America. So today we should be colorblind. We shouldn't pay attention to race. But if since the civil rights era did not end racism in America, if you're colorblind, you have no tools then to attack the continuing legacy of Jim Crow in America. And Bonilla Silva points out it's a very powerful move by conservatives to ask, like John Roberts, to say, we're being colorblind. We're the ones who don't want to discriminate. Because then they can defend against any change that would topple the racial hierarchy in America. So that's, that, that is, Bonilla Silva was talking about the cult kind of colorblindness that John Roberts, Chief Justice John Roberts was talking about. Now, I'm arguing there's a new twist on it, which brings in this new racial science. And the twist is that there is social race which is what people who are opposing racism are talking about. But that's, we shouldn't pay attention to that. That's not important. What's really important is biological race. The biological differences <coughs> between people 
of different racial grouping. And so Sally Saitel, who wrote this article on the front page of the New York Times Magazine some years ago, I am a racially profiling doctor, where she defended uh, prescribing different doses of Prozac to her patients depending on race. Uh, she also claimed that, um, well, she, she referred to an anesthesiologist she knows who uh, uses different methods of uh, intubation in black, it's black patients and white patients because black patients sell, I can't remember, salivate more or less. She had to retract that later on because people told her there's absolutely no basis for that dis racial distinction that you put in your article. But she has been writing up to justify uh, taking account of biological race and medical practice. And so with, when Vidal uh, was about to be approved, uh, she argues that Vidal is concerned with biological race. And that is what race really is. So we can be colorblind about social race, race at the societal level, but we have to pay attention to race at the biological level. Similarly, John Entine, who wrote the book Taboo, Why Black Athletes Dominate, in Sp Dominate Sports and Why We're Afraid to Talk About It, where he argues that black people are naturally prone to be athletic, and that's proof that race is a biological category. Uh, he's going to be brave enough to talk about it. Um, he wrote, uh, also in response to uh, the approval of Vidal, we talk a lot about diversity in the United States as long as we wink and smile that this diversity is not real. Now here, he's, he's sort of saying it's a, it's a joke. Like when people talk about diversity in education, we wink as I guess he and his friends wink and smile about it. It's not, it's not important that, that social diversity isn't important. But in some aspects of, of humanity, it is very real. And so where is race real? In our genes, right? And such differences can have huge consequences in everything from sports performance, which he already has written as what black people are good at, to success in the classroom, which is what he thinks people like him are good at. So what are these commentators saying? Racial differences are real at the molecular level, but merely constructed in society. So there's a real biological race. Different societies constructed differently. But what happens of it, about race in society isn't, that's not what's important. If we can be colorblind about race in society, we can't be colorblind about race in medicine or in intelligence. You know he added in the classroom. Genetic race is scientific truth. Anti-racism is just ideology. So he would say about everything I've been saying today, even though I think it's based on scientific evidence, he'd say, well, she's just talking about that's her anti-racist ideology. But scientists know that race really makes a difference in your genes, and you should listen to the scientists. Of course, he's only going to quote the scientists who are looking for racial differences at the biological level. All right, so let me, I want to conclude by pointing to another technology that I didn't mention yesterday, and I saved it for today because I think it's part of my theme for today of why care, why worry. And this technology is the huge buildup of DNA databases, of uh, DNA collected from people who uh, are convicted of many, many crimes, types of crimes, but more and more people are only arrested uh, for crimes. So this whole uh, process of collecting DNA started with sex offenders and people 
convicted of very serious felonies like kidnapping and murder. It then went beyond that to the collection of DNA of people who were convicted of less serious felonies. New York State just passed a law last year allowing collection from people who are convicted of misdemeanors. California passed a law a few years ago allowing DNA collection for people who are only arrested for crimes, including children, including children. So this has been increasing over the last decade. Uh, Congress passed a law a few years ago allowing any federal agent to collect DNA from anyone detained, which includes undocumented uh, immigrants or people suspected to be undocumented immigrants. So it's, it's, it's mushrooming, it's skyrocketing. Um, and I say that these people are permanent suspects because once your DNA is in the database, the whole point of it is when a sample of DNA is collected at a crime scene, it's run through the database. So everybody in the database is a potential suspect to see if they get a hit, in which case uh, you now will probably be arrested and the DNA will be used as some people think conclusive evidence against you. Um, I don't have time to go into why this is troubling. I'll just say most, if I ask most people, would you mind if the police came by and collected your DNA and put it in a database? I think most people wouldn't want that to happen. Um, and so there's, I think most people have a sense this is an invasion of their privacy. There's also lots of evidence of ways in which this uh, DNA collection and uh, processing can be uh, prone to error with people who, whose DNA has been mixed up. The, you just type in the wrong number for you know, one of the genes and you can um, find the wrong person. But the main thing I want to say for now is that it is the DNA in the federal uh, database CODIS is very grossly disproportionately from African Americans. Uh, the estimate back in 2006 was that it was at least 40%, although African Americans are only 13% of the national population. And more and more states are using familial searches, meaning if there's a partial match of a crime scene sample to someone in the database, police will go to their relatives and ask for a sample. Their relatives become suspects now. Given the number of arrests of black people in some communities, if the police are going to collect their DNA and potentially their relatives' DNA, if there really is the threat of a nearly universal database of urban black men in America. Now, some people say, well, what difference does it make if you're innocent? Who cares if your DNA is in the database? Again, I would say, well, okay, you volunteer your DNA. Anyone who says that to me, please go volunteer to put your DNA in the database, which is just as much justification you're going to be collecting it from people who have not been convicted of a crime at all. Um, but I think there's even a bigger danger because of the growing connections being made between genes and propensity to crime. And I'm not saying these are valid connections, but more and more scientists are making these connections in a context where there is a long-standing myths and stereotypes about black people being prone to crime. Myths that seem to be confirmed by the disproportionate number of black people who are incarcerated. And you put this together with studies like this described by Kevin Beaver at Florida State, where he says that gangs typically have been regarded as a sociological phenomenon, but his investigation shows that this gene mutation plays a significant role. This is the mutation known uh, colloquially as the warrior gene that is supposed to predispose people to aggression and violence. Now, when uh, Americans learn that gang, people who are gang members become gang members, and he also added are more likely to use guns, 
because of a gene. I think many will associate gangs with blacks and Latinos and then assume that blacks and Latinos have this gene or are more likely to have this gene. And that gets reinforced when the DNA databases are filled pre predominantly with DNA from blacks and Latinos. I'm not saying any of this makes sense, but it's the way in which many people think. And if you think I'm making this up, this is the picture that the Associated Press put online when they reported on Kevin Beaver's study with the headline, Gang Banging May Be Genetic. And it showed a picture of what seemed to be Latino men uh, looking very tough, I suppose, and uh, the, but really looking tough are the armed uh, military behind them. To me, this picture has all these elements that I've been talking about in it. It has the stereotype that people who belong to gangs are, um, are a black and Latino, that they are prone to be members of gangs because of their genes. There's something natural in being black and Latino that <coughs> predisposes you to gang banging. And that the way to address it, because it's natural, you know, you, there's nothing, you can't have social programs that are going to address it. A sociological approach is the wrong approach. The only way to address it is either through eugenic means or through brute force to contain people like that. That's, you may read this picture differently, that's what I read into the meaning of that picture and why they chose that picture to accompany the story. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, Evelyn Hammonds, uh, a historian of science at Harvard, uh, has made, I think, very um, poignantly the point that I hope you've seen run throughout my lectures yesterday and today, that the reason why <coughs> it's so powerful to link today's genetic progress with race is because it naturalizes the social order. It makes it seem as if the inequality that exists today is just natural. It's part of nature. The uh, thinking that race is a fact of nature leads people to think, and it's supposed to lead people to think, that racial inequality is a fact of nature. And that's why it's so appealing to so many people, despite all the flaws that I hope you've seen that <laughs> persuaded you exist in the science and the thinking about this. So I'm going to close the way I did yesterday, which is to say that instead of adopting that view, despite all the people who say, don't worry about it, take advantage of it, uh, there's nothing to worry about, that uh, instead we will affirm our shared humanity by rejecting the myth that human beings are naturally divided into races and instead working to overcome the social injustices that are preserved by the social and political system of race. So thank you very much and I'm happy to <laughs>
you could read different things in the photo. I can't see a positive reading of it. <laughs> but no, I know. So I'm saying your uh, disturbing reading of it may be just as, uh, of course, you know, it's all about what do, how do we interpret it, right? And um, that could be the case as well. I think it is very interesting to think about how the post 9-11, I mean, I focused on privatization, increased punitive governance. Another important component of the political context today is the war on terror post 9-11. And to think about how that is changing the meaning of race, the, the racial classifications, um, and uh, the way it's changing the, um, the willingness of many Americans to justify extremely brutal treatment of people. You know, in, in my book, Fail Invention, the last chapter, I have story after story of the basically torture of people at the hands of either the US government or state and local governments. Um, my editor at first said, this is a little extreme, you know, why are you writing about, but th throughout writing this book, of course I was writing it at the time that the Bush administration, when I started writing Bush was a president, and the Bush administration was explicitly justifying torture of other human beings for the sake of the war on terror. And I was deeply affected by that, and throughout writing the book, I thought, this is the context in which this science is going on. It's going on, not, you know, not in liberal democracy where everybody's free to choose, it's going on in the context of, and the polls were saying that many Americans supported this, right? So the context of a country that is willing to justify torturing other human beings, and who are the human beings being tortured? You, I think it's a racialized concept of who can be tortured. I, I, I wrote a, an article called Torture and the Biopolitics of Race explicitly on this, where I compare lynching, the justification for lynching and the impact of lynching, and the justification and impact of torturing people called enemy com combatants. You, there has to be a way of people in power separating, dehumanizing the people who are going to be tortured. You have to be able to say those people who can be tortured are a different class of human being or subhuman. That's the only, that, that's always have, you can look at, I looked at, well, I looked at the, the case of the French torturing Algerians, you know, lots of, in fact, one of the best books I read was about the French torture of Algerians and how they justified it. It happens so consistently. I mean, I, I can't say I did an exhaustive study of torture, but I really, and I, you know, I don't want to sound alarmist, but I really think that we have to think about the, the implications of this message that human beings are divided into naturally occurring races that are so distinct from each other, it determines, as John Entine said, performance in sports or in the classroom. And that is, that's the kind of thinking that has justified such extreme brutality. And that brutality, it's, go, it's going on. The, the other point I want to get across in my book is, how could it be that people in the United States are being tortured in cells right now, or in, on, in, on Guantanamo Bay, I don't know if you all read the um, recent op-ed piece by a man being held now in, um, in Guantanamo for, I don't know how long, I can't remember how long it was, more than a decade. He's never charged with a crime. He basically, as he says, uh, the US government hasn't shown any other evidence, that he uh, went to Afghanistan from, I can't remember what country he was originally from, to find a job. And he ended up in the hands of the US government shipped to Guantanamo Bay, and he's part of a hunger strike there. But everyone who's on a hunger strike 
is being force fed, and he described it. Was so his lawyer wrote it, you know, based on his conversation with him. The the what happens when you're force fed? They shove a, a a hose down your throat, a tube down your throat, and how painful it is, and how dehumanizing it is. And so I just I yesterday, day before yesterday, when did I come here? Yesterday on the plane, I was reading some of the letters that are still coming in to the New York Times about it. You know, one letter saying these, these are medical personnel who are doing this. So what, uh, what makes someone who's trained as a doctor or a nurse, who is trained to help people, went into the profession presumably to help people, how can they do something that the, per the person they're doing to say, says, you are torturing me, screaming in pain, telling them to stop, and they're still shoving it down. I mean, he said they're, they're doing it to so many people that they're doing so quickly that they, they go down the wrong way. They, I mean, it just was, I really, it's horrible. I mean, I was close to tears. I am close to tears now thinking about it. Just horrific. How can a doctor do that or a nurse do that? I think they can do it because they see the person in front of them is not fully human like they are. And I, I firmly believe that race, seeing people as a different, a different type of human being from you, allows people to do these kinds of acts on others. And again, maybe we'd have nothing to worry about if we lived in a society where nobody would possibly do that. But the point is we're living in a society where it's going on right now. So the, you know, how could you say, well, the, what you're saying is extreme? What do you mean it's extreme? It's happening. It's actually happening. You know, prison conditions are not that different from that in many prisons in this country. Um, and so, I'm sorry, I'm going on a <laughs> rant, but I, I really, I just feel that it's so dangerous what is happening in terms of this redefinition of race and. It's important to, to really understand how, the, how high the stakes are in this. Yeah. You know, I have a question about the, these black race studies. Uh-huh. Um, oh, like the, the preterm birth, where they use yeah. black race as a category. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very uh, how, how prevalent is it um, in the medical literature um, to look at other black societies? When talking about the black race, um, uh -huh. I mean, even yeah. not even necessarily only in medical stuff, but you know, a, a, a yeah. couple of decades ago, there was a big flap about intelligence testing and yeah. results. Yeah, um, and I was just wondering, um, you know, what you know, what would be revealed uh, by looking at uh, performance of black people in societies other than the United States yeah. and comparing that yeah. uh, to the United States. I mean, are yes. people doing any of that? Or? Yeah. Well, there is a study um, by Richard Cooper who contests many of the, he, he, he shows the flaw, the kinds of flaws I showed. Residual confounding is one that he's written several articles on with also an epidemiologist named Jay Kaufman, um, showing how these studies fail to control for certain important variables and therefore cannot reach conclusions that genetics, that genes are the cause. But he also did a study uh, where a meta-analysis where he looked at studies of differences in hypertension mm -hmm. uh, globally. Uh -huh. And he found that uh, Nigerians and Jamaicans have lower rates of hypertension than whites in America, and that Germans have higher, also have higher rates of hypertension <laughs> than people in Nigeria and, um, and Jamaica. Uh, it's African Americans, people, again, like the study, I, I, well, I didn't mention the study, but there's also a study looking at uh, 
premature birth and low birth weight that the one I mentioned that found that looking at Af recent African immigrant women and comparing them to African American women who were born in the United States, finding that recent African immigrant women have comparable, um, give birth to babies with comparable birth weights as um, uh, white women. Well, how so, much influence um, <laughs> those studies? I mean, you know, shouldn't they, those kind of studies then uh, counter this other stuff? There has, there has been, yes, absolutely. There's so much evidence to counter all of these flawed studies I've been talking about. Uh, but for one thing, they don't get the kind of press coverage that the genetic studies get. Uh, and they, they don't seem to settle the issue. I mean, they, they're counter, see, Alden Morris just walked in. I've mentioned your talk several times. <laughs> this is the professor who's talking about Du Bois. You know, as I said, Du Bois countered this in 1898, you know. And, uh, and just as Professor Morris was saying, that he doesn't get the attention. He still hasn't gotten the attention until the book comes out. Then he'll get the attention that he deserves. He was marginalized in the academy then, and the same thing happens now. There are, I don't want to make it sound as if there aren't excellent research studies being done that, and that have been done you know, since 1898, showing that the reason for these racial inequities is not genes, it's social inequality. Or, and even more directly, the impact of racism directly on people's health, um, you know, in the form of stress. Those studies have been done. Nancy Krieger, for example, uh, at Boston School of Public Health, she just churns out these brilliant studies showing uh, in all different ways how racism affects health, studies looking explicitly at how racism affects health, showing uh, that uh, the gaps in racial, uh, racial gaps in health decrease as a result of better social policies and then increase again as a result of worse social policies, you know. Um, it just in all sorts of ways. You know, this, the evidence is there. You take, for example, the evidence that high rates of asthma in poor black neighborhoods are caused by environmental uh, hazards. That evidence has been there for decades. I mean, there, we know why. Black kids of the South Bronx have higher rates of asthma. There was a study, it's at least a decade old, that had the children going around with backpacks that measured the amount of pollution in their neighborhoods. And the ones who lived in the white neighborhoods showed little pollution. And the, one, the little kids in the backpacks that lived in the South Bronx, there was a lot of pollution. I mean, all of this has been studied. So we know, we know that, and yet we still continue to get this patently flawed research that gets headlines in the New York Times. But the, re the research is there. It's there. There's, I, you know, there's potential for more research. I think we have enough to put this to rest, but there are, um, there are interesting studies that are continuing that, that challenge, you know, these, these studies based on race as a fact of nature. But, um, it just, it continues, it continues. Did you have a, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Teresa, you had your hand up before, yeah. Well, I was just gonna <clears throat> say that there's a little hope, I mm -hmm. think, that, um, that there are researchers now who are understanding the interaction of the social and the biological, mm -hmm. because one of the things about the low birth weight mm -hmm. and that is how can something that happens every generation not be genetic. Mm -hmm. And actually part of the low birth weight, premature birth and that in black women is associated with being small for gestational age. And it's mm -hmm. actually slower growth in the placenta, in the uterus, mm -hmm. which they think is due to placental blood flow. Mm -hmm. And now it's been proposed that there are actually intergenerational effects 
and I'll use shorthand, yeah. but the effect of racism and high cortisol in your pregnancy is actually affecting the vasculature of your yeah. placenta. You have a small baby. It's probable, more probable, that your daughter will have a small baby, not because it was genetic, but because the racism didn't go away. Yes, right, right, yes. And epigenetics also that, you know, shows that, yeah, no, it, there are other explanations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll try to stop talking about pregnant black women. <laughs> <We'll be fine. laughs> You'll be fine. Just have a lot of loving people, you, which I'm sure you do. <laughs> okay, and oh, do we need to end? Or there was well, uh, this lady over here had her hand up. I didn't know if there's time. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more about or if you come across in for early genetic studies, um, the connections between sort of intelligence testing and <laughs> and performance in the classroom, like that quote, yeah, um, yeah. and the creation of like race specific products like charter schools. And if that is something that if that connection could be made or if you made that or what yeah. you Well the the whole the whole industry of, of intelligence testing continues, and there's also a whole slew of studies that are continuing to be conducted trying to show that intelligence is genetic and that the reasons for low performance on various tests by race you know, have to do with inherited um, defects. So that continues, just, just like the gang-banging theory. You know, it's all very much related, I think. Um, but there's also research that looks into other explanations for why black students don't perform as well on certain kinds of tests. I mean, there, so there's, um, and this doesn't go to the charter schools and that <laughs> question of race-specific products, but you know, there's, um, for example, the stereotype threat literature, like you know, Claude Steele and others' work, um, that shows how uh, stereotypes themselves can affect people's performance on tests, and he's conducted. Uh, very powerful experiments that show that just priming somebody to be aware of stereotypes before they take a test can affect their performance on the test. And if it happens to white people as well as black people, Asian people, it doesn't matter. You know, so he shows that if you uh, tell white students that they're going to be compared to Asian students before they take a math test, they do worse on the math test than the group that you don't tell they're going to be compared to Asians. So even white people fall prey to this to stereotype threat. Um, so there's, you know, there, there's that. Then there's other kinds of studies that have looked at how, um, now those studies look at the way in which students of color primarily themselves respond to stereotype and how that affects their own performance, but there's also studies that look, for example, at how teachers treat students of color and uh, the subtle ways in which teachers shut down students of color or see the enthusiasm of a black student for a subject as hyperactivity but the same enthusiasm of a white student they see as that shows they're really eager to learn. You know, those kinds of things that affect students. There's studies that look at the resources that students have. You know, we know that most black students in this country don't have the resources that support their education that white students are more likely to have. I just read a study recently in Philadelphia looking at two adjacent communities of Chestnut Hill and, um, uh, oh gosh, it just flew out my head. I can't think of the name of the community, but anyway, it's one is predominantly white, middle class, upper middle class, one is working class, uh, disproportionately black. 
just looking at the libraries. And, and the researchers found that in both communities, children make use of the library. In fact, in the black community, lot, children were always in the library because that's where they went after school. They, you know, they went to the library. But the difference was that in the white community, there were lots of computers, they were all working. In the black community, there was one computer that children had to line up to use, and, and the researcher found that they would start trying to work on their homework. They could never finish because they only had a limited amount of time, and therefore most of the children didn't even try to do their homework on it. So they would use the computer to play games, whereas in the white community, they had all the time they needed. Everyone could use a computer, and so they'd do their homework. And there were people who would help them with their homework. But in a way, it was not at all that the black children didn't want to learn or didn't, weren't interested in going to the library. They didn't have the facilities to help them. You know, just basic things like that. I mean, I could just go on and on and on and on and on. It's studied that at, at Northwestern, at Institute for Policy Research, looking at the sleep habits. You know, there are a lot of the anthropologists there and socio, socio well, I don't know, are they in socio, the ones that do the biomarkers? Um, I think they're an anthropologist, a medical anthropologist, and they're in human development and social policy. They put biomarkers on uh, students and measure how much sleep they get and their cortisol levels and things like that. And what, what they found is that many of the black students weren't getting enough sleep because they, they were going on public transportation to get to the magnet school way far from their uh, neighborhoods. So just things like that. You have less sleep you're not going to perform as well in school. Um, I, I could just go on and on and on. You know, the ways it would, another study, I literally could go on all day <laughs> with this, but because it just infuriates me when people say that there's, you know, black children don't want to learn, that it's cultural, black culture doesn't appreciate education as much, that's the reason why the parents don't support their education, or that it's natural. There are institutional things that happen outside the parents' control and outside the children's control that block them. I'll just say one more. In Los Angeles, I heard a report in Los Angeles, the truancy officers that go after kids if they're late for school, and they line up at the bus stops in black and Latino neighborhoods so when the children miss the bus, they can give them a ticket which costs their parents money Instead of saying, can I give you a ride to school, <laughs> right? They give them a ticket, bye-bye, which then harms their families because the family has to pay the ticket or their, their children aren't going to graduate, be able to graduate. But it's like the setup to keep them from doing well in school. And we haven't even gotten to the pro racial profiling by police in the neighborhood, you know, all of that. Um, so there's, there's so much that could be done, so many social determinants. That's why when researchers control for zip code or control for WIC receipt or welfare receipt and then say, oh, we've controlled for all the social variables, therefore it must be genetic, the reason why the children don't do well in school or why that black mothers give birth to low-weight babies, or why, what, you know, whatever inequality. There's so much, so many social determinants that can and do explain that aren't accounted for. That's why these, these genetics, so many of these genetic studies that are based on controlling, you know, black race independent of social factors are so flawed because they haven't even started to scratch the surface of all the social impediments and reasons for inequality, they cannot possibly <coughs> jump to the conclusion that it's genetic. And I really don't understand how a study like the one I showed could even be published. It was so flawed. But as I said, not only published headline in the New York Times, I would like to see more headlines in the New York Times. Children, black children in LA, black and teacher in LA, prevented from learning by the police, by the truancy <laughs> officers. You know, that's what we should be seeing. Let's do something about that, not 
continue to search for the genetic reason. Why? Great op-ed piece. <laughs> yeah, well, get the New York Times to publish these things. <laughs> I've sent them to the New York Times. They don't want to publish these no, things on no. genetics and race. They, they, really, they really don't. Anyway, thank you very much for <laughs> staying over time. <laughs>